Uh, good evening, folks. As Barb said, my name's Brett. I'm uh, the Wildlife Management Supervisor for our District 5. We have five districts in, uh, in the state, so I cover southwestern Ohio, uh, everywhere from the river north to uh, Mercer County, where Grand Lake St. Mary's uh, is located. Then we go east over towards uh, Highland County, Adams County, over that way. So 17 counties all together. So just to give you all a little background where I'm coming from, uh, uh, Bruce also works out of the office. Our office is located in Xenia. Now, uh, I'm going to short little slideshow. I, I did include more than just coyotes. Uh, I know a lot of folks have questions about coyotes. But oftentimes I find when I uh, come to an event that uh, is animal specific that folks end up with a lot of questions about a lot of other critters. So Bruce is going to uh, drive the, uh, the PowerPoint here for a second. Uh, a little bit of an introduction that wildlife management uh, is often thought of terms in, in protecting and enhancing wildlife. But there's also um, managing and reducing conflicts. It varies from person to person, community uh, to community of uh, what perceived is a conflict and what reality is a conflict. So a little history of uh, wildlife in Ohio. Uh, wildlife belongs to everybody in Ohio. So coyotes, deer, geese, and all that stuff belong to all of us. The Division of Wildlife is charged with the management of wildlife. We do research on wildlife. Uh, we set and regulate hunting and fishing seasons, trapping seasons. Uh, we manage public hunting areas for folks to come and, and hunt on. We come to events like this uh, to inform folks, to, to answer questions. Uh, we have a law enforcement branch, the, the Game Warden. I'm sure a lot of folks have heard of the Game Warden. A little history of Ohio. Uh, as uh, Ohio was settled uh, back in the early 1800s, the, the landscape was drastically changed. Uh, lots of clearing. And what that led to was a uh, loss of habitat and ultimately a loss of what is known as large keystone predators, also referred to as apex predators. These are the timber wolves, the mountain lions, uh, the black bears, bobcats, large critters like that. So basically they were uh, ran out of the state. That being said, uh, there are animals, and the animals that survive well are the animals that are able to adapt and live within these uh, new landscapes that we created. Damage prevention, uh, have a plan. It's, it's a, you want to educate yourself. You want to know what kind of critter you're dealing with. Call us, get some information, use other resources. And you see the next one, it's do not feed wildlife. Many conflicts uh, that folks have with wildlife can be linked to people feeding wildlife. Feeding wildlife, it, it can be a lot of fun, right? It gets you a chance to see animals that you wouldn't see otherwise. But oftentimes, feeding a wildlife can be a, a very selfish thing. It may attract additional wildlife to your property, uh, but it's also attracting additional wildlife to your neighbor's property. It often reduces the innate fear that wildlife should have in people. Does this mean you shouldn't have a bird feeder? No. Be responsible with it. Realize that your actions uh, can impact your neighbors. Uh, and oftentimes, who ultimately pays the price is the, is the wildlife that is fed. Uh, eliminate places where wildlife can enter buildings. That's uh, some common sense stuff. Uh, yeah, I get calls of raccoons in the attic. Well, how's it getting in? Well, through the big hole in my vent. Uh, I'd recommend closing up the hole in your vent, right? So some common sense stuff. Keep property clean. Um, uh, that means keep your trash picked up, uh, keep trash cans uh, lids closed, uh, even uh, having some brush around and stuff can, uh, can attract wildlife. And in places where, uh, where it's legal and, and practical to give hunters uh, and trappers uh, permission to hunt and trap. Hunters and trappers are a great tool to uh, reduce that conflict. Identify the species and animals, uh, amount or loss of damage uh, often dictates uh, how much effort or resources you're willing to invest into uh, reducing conflicts. So uh, if you're losing a, a couple hostas, it may not be as important as if you have a large hole in your roof um, as far as damage and amount of value that, that it is to you. Uh, the nature of the conflict and of course the cost associated with alleviating, alleviating the damage. Uh, oftentimes it can be a, a relatively simple fix, but sometimes it can be quite costly. Uh, so the question is, uh, do I fix it myself? It's a possibility uh, where you can and you're capable of, of setting traps or doing other means to uh, reduce or eliminate conflicts, by all means. Uh, the other option is to call a licensed nuisance animal trapper. Uh, there are folks out there that are professional uh, nuisance animal trappers, just like calling a roofer or a plumber if you don't know how or don't have the time. It's good to call a professional. Uh, it's a whole list of them on our website. They're listed by county. 
they're not restricted to a county, but they're listed by county for out, of, out of convenience. So some specific uh, animals I'm going to talk about uh, and some of their control options. Uh, this is a big one uh, that you see in and around a lot of urban areas, uh, Canada geese. Canada geese are uh, a migratory bird. Uh, they are protected uh, via the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, however, there are uh, a variety of tactics that can be utilized to uh, reduce conflicts. And here's a, a list of some of the uh, non-lethal means that are recommended. Uh, barriers, fencing, dogs are great. Uh, pyrotechnics, sometimes you want to work with your neighbors with these. And again, underline, stop feeding. Uh, if somebody's feeding the geese, you're never going to get rid or reduce the, the problem of the geese. Uh, uh, this is, uh, highlights another issue uh, of uh, geese being aggressive. They're generally aggressive during their nesting season when they have a, an active nest. Uh, this gentleman here uh, was, my, uh, was my predecessor, a uh, fellow by the name of Dan Freevert. Uh, he can make a goose attack him at will. He actually did this on purpose just to get a picture. So uh, Dan took one for the team, if you will. Uh, so Bruce, if you would. Uh, Canada, Canada geese control, again, uh, there is a regulated hunting season for, for Canada geese. While this isn't always an option, it is very effective at moving geese and, and deterring them from an area. So you see where it says early and regular, there's an early season specifically for Canada geese. Comes in the first couple weeks of September, and then there's a regular season that comes in in, in a more of a traditional time when folks think of hunting season, uh, October, November, and later on into the winter. Egg addling or shaking. Nest destruction, um, you see where this says permit required. You remember when I uh, mentioned that Canada geese are uh, protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? Well, in order to legally uh, uh, destroy an egg or nest or to handle a goose, you have to have a permit. We issue permits either to individuals or businesses, uh, but we also issue permits to homeowners associations, condo associations, uh, apartment complexes, and, and and uh, other entities such as that. There is no charge for a permit. Uh, they're available online. I'll, I'll uh, provide a website here in a minute. Uh, goose roundup and shooting permits. These are the lethal side of the goose permits. Uh, there are limits and restrictions on methods of take, uh, as well as how many birds may be uh, removed with the permit. Uh, and the roundup is kind of what it sounds. The geese are rounded up in a pen. Uh, Canada geese go through a flightless period every year, referred to as a molt. Generally early June through, oh, July, mid-July or so uh, before they're able to fly again. But you'll see them and you're like, why the heck are these things flying? Why are they just running around? That's because they've gone through a molt and they're actually not capable of flight. So they can be rounded up and, and removed during that time of year with a permit, of course. And here's how you get a permit. You can contact your wildlife office or you can go online and complete what is referred to as a goose damage report. And you can do that on our website, uh, wildohio.com. Uh, other critters that folks run into and have issues with, uh, raccoons, skunks, possums, a lot of these conflicts can be uh, reduced, again, by removing sources of food and water. Uh, pet food, a lot of folks like to feed their cats outside. I'm not saying you can't do that, uh, but don't leave food out all night. Feed your cats at a set time each day. Believe me, they'll learn, they, even though they can't tell time, their, their belly can. So they'll start showing up at the same time each day. Uh, bird feeders, again, if the birds are feeding out of the feeder, they're spreading seed all over the place, it makes them ready, readily accessible to these animals to get off the ground. And the last one, you may wonder, you know, what's grub killer going to do? Well, skunks in particular, are uh, they really like to eat grubs out of your lawn. And uh, you may come out in the... Uh, uh, late spring, early summer, and it looks like there's been a hog come through your backyard. Well, that's probably a skunk. Uh, secure garbage can lids uh, is, is another uh, <coughs> uh, important method. Uh, raccoons can be very persistent at getting in your garbage cans. Make sure there's a way to snap it down or put a large or a heavy weight on it. Exclusion. I use electric fence around my garden. I set up three strands, one about three inches for rabbits and squirrels, one about six inches for uh, raccoons, and then one about about hip high uh, for deer, and it keeps critter out of my garden. The only thing I have to do is keep the grass out of the out of the electric fence because if you let it grow up in the fence, then it grounds it out. Uh, live trap with an ID tag. By law, your traps have to be tagged, even if it's in your backyard. You have to have a, a tag on it with your name and address, saying who you are. So uh, we know our law enforcement folks and other folks know if you're if there's an issue with that trap. 
um, then we know who to contact. Uh, and the next line here, and it says, live trap and euthanize or release on site. These animals here, as well with some other animals, fall into a category of, of animal that cannot legally be relocated. The primary reason is for uh, a spread of disease. Uh, these animals are vectors for rabies. The other reason is, uh, once an animal is accustomed to people and using people as a food source, well, that's what they know. So the first thing they're going to do is run up to the first house they find. They say, well, it's in the country. Uh, well, people live in the country, too. And country folk don't like raccoons in their garbage any more than folks that live in town. So it's just taking the problem and moving it from your backyard to somebody else's backyard. Uh, released on site, some folks say, well, that's, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why would I want to release it on site? Uh, you'd have an opportunity, say, a raccoon in your haddock. You could capture the animal, secure where it's coming in and out. You know, I told you about the hole in the vent. You fix that. You can let the raccoon go outside, and then you, you solved your problem, and the raccoon gets to live another day, if you will. Uh, ground squirrels, uh, chipmunks, they get in your flower beds, and they root around, and they dig holes. It's usually the big thing. Sometimes they get into your house, and, uh, uh, and that's where the bird seed storage and uh, uh, pet food storage is important. These critters can be trapped and, and moved around. Uh, take them down the road and, and let them go. Moles. Uh, moles are uh, fairly common. Again, chasing grubs and worms and stuff in your yard, but they leave nasty tunnels around. The most successful and practical method of dealing with moles is with a trap. Groundhogs. You can uh, use barriers to, to help keep them out. Uh, they can be captured and relocated. Uh, they are t a tough critter to get in a trap, though. As if you think what a groundhog eats, he eats grass and clover and stuff like that. So what's there to really draw him into a trap? And they can be hunted year-round. So uh, if you're on your own property, uh, you don't have to have a hunting license uh, to hunt groundhogs or to hunt at all. Now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about coyotes. Uh, these are a variety of pictures that I've uh, grabbed. It shows the, the diversity of a coyote. Up here in the, in the upper left is the natural setting, if you will. They're hunting their most uh, preferred prey, small mammals. Uh, those, they're probably pouncing on either mice or meadow voles. And then some of the other pictures uh, show uh, coyotes in some different environments. The, the one uh, there where you see it in the, with the bottles uh, behind it, that coyote walked into uh, the back door of a restaurant um, and climbed into the cooler. <laughs> Why it did that? I, Nobody knows. Uh, the animal was successfully uh, removed. That was actually in uh, Chicago. Chicago is absolutely full of coyotes. Very little conflicts. It just goes to show how adaptable uh, uh, these animals are. And then, of course, in the, on the far right there and on the bottom right, it, it shows some of the, uh, uh, the darker side, if you will. Uh, that's a coyote taken down, uh, down a sheep. Uh, and in the top right there, it shows a, a coyote uh, approaching what appears to be a child. I'm pretty sure that picture is staged, but uh, uh, I used it anyways. Uh, the coyote running in behind a jogger. I don't think the coyote was at least a bit interested in the jogger. It just, they happened to be filling the same space at a time. So I just threw these up here to show how diverse they are, the, the diverse amount of habitats that they can fill the, from the most rural areas that we all expect them to be in to the most urban and suburban areas that we can imagine. Uh, the bottom left here is some signs put up in a uh, community in uh, British Columbia. Uh, and an interesting line here, a fed animal is a dead animal. So those are good lines to go by. What do coyotes look like? I, I get all kinds of calls when people say, I, I, saw this, I saw this coyote, it was 150 pounds, it was uh, just the most massive animal I've ever seen. Coyotes just don't get 150 pounds, so uh, I'm a little bit skeptical. But coyotes have pointy ears, uh, upright pointy ears, never flopped, uh, a narrow uh, pointy snout, bushy tail in a down position. Average weight for a coyote, 25, 40 pounds. There's reports of some bigger than that, but they are they are rare. I, I would equate the a person or a coyote bigger than that to the the 300 pound man. Are there 300 pound guys? Sure. But there are not very many of them. So uh, that is what the typical coyote is, uh, looks like. Uh, the coloring on this animal in the picture, uh, very standard of, of what you see. That 
uh, reddish gray uh, mottled color, uh, but they can vary greatly. Uh, anywhere from uh, blonde, kind of like the color on its belly or its rump, uh, to jet black. The coyote print is, is fairly small, about the size of a jumbo chicken egg or so, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And you can kind of see the shape of the track. Uh, coyote prints tend to be more, more round, um, whereas the domestic dog, uh, more splayed. Uh, and they're, the way their tracks uh, follow, their tracks tend to be more in line. Where you see uh, the dog track, he runs over, sniffs a tree, then he runs over and looks uh, looks in the window, then he runs back over to the hydrant and sniffs around. So, uh, coyote tracks generally very focused, uh, going in a direction. Uh, where do coyotes come from? This map actually shows their current distribution. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier about the changes in the landscape uh, when Europeans came in and settled Ohio. Uh, coyotes uh, initially had a habitat very much here in the Plain States. Montana on south there, North Dakota, South Dakota, on down towards, uh, towards Kansas, uh, Oklahoma. And remember I said that the, uh, a lot of the trees were removed from Ohio and the, and the apex predators were removed? Well, that created a void, and that void was filled by the coyotes. And they've slowly and continually spread all directions, north, south, east, and west, um, so now they're uh, found in all 88 counties of Ohio, again, for the most rural areas to the most uh, urban areas. Uh, coyotes' peak breeding time, peak mating period is February. Uh, what else is going on that time of year? Uh, a lot of times we got snow on the ground. There's not a whole lot of leaf cover on. There's not a whole lot of crop standing. So there's a lot of things um, going for making coyotes more visible. Uh, a lot of times there's snow on the ground, like I mentioned, and then you see tracks. So you may not even see the animal, but you got tracks going through your yard. Uh, generally, the litters are born uh, in and around April, average four to seven. They can get a little bit larger than that, uh, 10, 11, 12, uh, up towards the max, depending on the resources available. So if there's a lot of food, a lot of shelter, a lot of water available, they could have more pups. Uh, they are a pack animal, so I know a lot of folks, when they think of a pack, they think of uh, the, the timber wolf, right? Uh, running around, uh, taking down elk and stuff like that. Uh, coyotes don't generally function like that. Uh, they defend their territory in the pack, but they don't necessarily hunt in a pack. Uh, and why is that? Because uh, you don't need three or four uh, animals to take down a, a meadow mouse or a meadow vole or a mouse or a rabbit. Uh, omnivores. <coughs> Omnivore, omnivore means that they'll eat darn near anything. So they are opportunistic. That means they'll eat the first thing that they, they come upon. Uh, but they also like easy meals. As the, as the uh, juveniles, the sub-adults mature, they'll go out on their own to find their own uh, territory, establish their own pack, if you will. Uh, largest predator in Ohio. So uh, they have definitely filled the niche that was vacated when the apex predators were removed. So coexisting versus conflict. So this kind of leads to some of the things we're, we were talking about. So this is a, a graduated scale, if you will, of when you should be least concerned to when you should be uh, more concerned, if you will. Uh, if you see starting at the top there, it says, you know, seeing coyotes uh, rarely out during nighttime hours. Most commonly they're active at night, most active in the twilight hours if you will, um, right at dawn, right at dusk. Uh, coyotes are generally very shy, if you will. So nighttime provides them the cover to, to move around. You're driving home from the ball game, uh, whatever, on, on Friday night, and a coyote runs across the yard. Okay, that's perfectly normal, right? No real concern there. Then if you see it starts... Uh, uh, racking up there a little bit. They're seen out occasionally during daytimes, uh, reports of missing house cats. Uh, then it comes up a little bit more. Uh, coyotes are seen frequently during the day. Pets are attacked in yards, right? So they're uh, no longer seeing people's homes as anything to be concerned about. And then if you look at the, the last uh, uh, line there, uh, coyotes are openly attacking pets, uh, even taking them off leashes. Uh, I've heard of reports of that before, uh, not necessarily in this area, but in, uh, in other, uh, other areas, approaching people without fear. So they see you standing there and they actively come towards you. Um, and, and acting aggressive. Acting aggressive is, um, Showing their teeth, 
growling, things of that nature. So up the top, to me, purely coexisting, right? No real issues, just coyote running around at night. That's what coyotes do. Down at the bottom, red flag. Some sort of action needs to be taken, right? If you look nationally at the uh, uh, amount of attacks that actually happen from coyotes, you'll, you'll find they're extremely rare. I've never had a report of a coyote attacking anybody, but every year I get five or six deer that attack people. Conflict and prevention. Do not feed coyotes uh, indirectly or directly. It just continues to break down that innate fear. And when they don't have that, it leads to conflicts. Grilling out probably isn't going to bring a coyote running to your deck begging for a hot dog. Uh, but the drippings that come down in your pan that would stay there, that's a very pungent smell um, that, that travels a, a fair distance. And I would recommend keeping that pan cleaned out. Uh, again, not just for coyotes, but for other critters as well. Scare tactics, we talked about motion lights and, uh, and, and air horns. Chase them till they leave your yard. Reinstill that fear. Let them know that you are the king in your domain. And, and they'll respond to that. When you go out and you shoo the coyote, and he goes 15, 20 paces away and looks at you, and then you turn and walk back in the house, he won. You reinforced his behavior. You just made him the 800-pound gorilla because he sees your behavior as being submissive. So you come out and go, hey, Coyote, get out of here. And he goes, and then you turn around and walk away. You just totally reinforce his behavior. Habitat modifications, that goes back to keeping your lawn cleared, uh, reducing places that harbor what they eat, you know, rabbits, uh, meadow voles and stuff. Uh, be a responsible pet owner. Uh, I, I target this mostly at the cat owners. Um, if you let your cat out at night and don't let it back into the morning time, there's a good chance something may happen to your cat, and it may be something besides a coyote. There's lots of dangers out there for a pet cat. If you love your cat, keep it in the house. Um, dogs, when they see a coyote, they may take off after it. I always, uh, uh, this is the, the Jack Russell Terrier syndrome, if you will. Uh, Jack Russell Terrier is 15 pounds, but in his mind, he is an 800-pound gorilla, right? There is nothing to stop him. Well, a, a coyote knows exactly what a coyote is, a, uh, a top-notch predator. And when a, when a terrier comes yapping at him, I don't think he's going to take any lip from him, to be quite honest with him. He's going to protect the coyote's territory. And then trapping and hunting. And I mentioned fencing there as well. Uh, Bruce, if you will, please. Websites, uh, wildohio.com. That's us. It's urbancoyoteresearch.com. Awesome website. 1-800-WILDLIFE. General information, you can get to us through 1-800-WILDLIFE as well. 1-800-POACHER for, for violations. All right, folks. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.